great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump, and uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels, uh, the bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. They have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda. And uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. And that helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much. Thank you. For Good evening, Norwich. You sound very lively, a lot more lively than they were in Birmingham. <laughs> this is the 11th hustings on our nationwide tour, and it's our penultimate outing. And believe me, the production team and me and all the people who've been all the time, we're getting a bit giddy now. It's good to be here in our eastern region and to welcome your regional chairman, Colin Noble, These hustings are for us, the members of the Conservative Party, to take part in a great exercise of democracy where we get to choose our new leader. She or he will be announced on the 5th of September, and as we're the party of government, then will become Prime Minister very soon afterwards. As Ian Dale, who moderated many of these hustings in 2019, said, I found chairing the hustings a surprisingly positive experience, the members really put the two candidates through their paces and asked some very searching questions. So I ask you tonight to make your questions searching, to make them succinct, and to ask questions and not to make statements. And one question each, please, so that more of the audience have an opportunity to grill our candidates. Both of our candidates have a duty and a desi desire to fulfill our 2019 manifesto. Their differences will be about how to go about achieving that in a very different world from 2019, post-Brexit, post-COVID, in uncertain times internationally, just look at Ukraine and Taiwan, and where our union as a nation is being challenged as never before. So I'm sure that you want to test both our candidates to seek to establish their strengths and to see who you think is best capable of running our great country. And I know as conservatives here that you'll all be respectful of our two candidates and keep your questions positive. There's now just over a week left to vote. If you haven't already, then you can cast your vote online or by post. It's very easy to vote online and you, or you can choose traditional snail mail. And if you do post, then please remember to put a stamp on your envelope <laughs> and, and note that there are planned postal strikes this weekend. So voting online is the way to go. You should all have received your ballot paper 
And if you haven't, then with some urgency now, please contact your constituency office who will try and help you out. My hope is that this evening will give you more clarity about how to cast your vote. I hope that you'll go away enthused and energised in your commitment to help our party win the next election. We need your help and support. Finally, I'd like to remind everyone that at the end of this democratic process, we have to come together as a party. We have many new members who should be contacted and made to feel welcome. We have members returning to the fold and we must make use of their talents. Ours has to be a combined effort under our new leader to go forward to victory at the next election. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's get on with the show. Please welcome Andrew Stevenson, Chairman of the Conservative Party. Hello, Norwich. <laughs> Delighted to join you for these, uh, this, um, the penultimate hustings. We've been traveling around the country, Peter and I, and the team organizing these hustings. We've been to the north, the south, the west, the northwest, the southwest. So I'm delighted that we're now here in the east of England. Some have criticized this process, claiming that the contest has now gone on too long. It's true that the two campaign teams and all the CCHQ staff organizing the hustings by this point are pretty knackered. But we're not doing this to keep the Westminster media bubble entertained. We're doing this for you, our members, because this is your choice. Conservative members from all parts of our country deserve their chance to see the two leadership contenders in action and to ask them the questions that you want answered. Central office staff and myself are remaining neutral in this contest. The choice is yours but we stand ready to unite behind whoever you choose as our next leader. From meeting Conservative activists at the 60 plus campaigning sessions I've taken part in since taking over as chairman, that's the message I'm hearing from the party's grassroots too. I heard it today when I was out campaigning with Tom Hunt in Ipswich and Chloe Smith's constituency here in Norwich. I heard it yesterday in Peterborough with Paul Bristow. Because we all know that we must unite and get behind these brilliant MPs and all the other brilliant MPs in this region like them to ensure that they are all re-elected at the next general election. And because we understand that our country needs a strong, united Conservative leadership to tackle the challenges we face. Whoever you vote for in this contest will become a brilliant leader and a brilliant Prime Minister. Both Liz and Rishi have shown their qualities in government and during this leadership contest. They've demonstrated the need to drive Britain forward and take on the hardest job in this country. They will take us forward together, continuing the excellent work done by our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who has shown that a Conservative government can rise to the challenges of today, getting Brexit done, delivering the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, protecting 14 million jobs during the pandemic, and leading the world in supporting Ukraine and standing up to Putin. It is a truly historic record on which our new leader can build. The alternative, of course, doesn't bear thinking about. It is a Labour government, a party that voted against tax cuts for low-income families, against additional investment in our NHS, against protecting our borders and tackling vile people smugglers. And let's not forget Sir Keir Starmer's record and what he has worked for, preventing Brexit, preventing the will of the people, and twice campaigning to put Jeremy Corbyn into Downing Street. Norwich, that is not somebody I want to see running this country, and I know it's not somebody you want to see running this country. It is our next Conservative leader who can continue to deliver for the British people, leading the way in standing up for our ideals and our partners on the world stage, uniting this country and our Conservative Party. So with no further ado, let me hand you over to our host for this evening, Talk TV's Julia Hartley Brewer.
Good evening, indeed, uh, from Norwich to Norwich. Uh, welcome to the penultimate hustings, as uh, the gentleman have mentioned, uh, in the race to become elected the next leader of the Conservative Party. But again, a small point for lots of people watching online and people who get to, uh, uh, well, I suppose, carry and continue to live in this country in the future, our next Prime Minister. Um, welcome here to those in Norwich who get to ask questions, but also to those watching at home on the live stream. The whole event is being live streamed on Talk TV's YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, tonight, as you know, we are going to hear from Foreign Secretary Liz Truss and former Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, Rishi Sunak, the two candidates fighting it out for the top job. Of course, only Conservative Party members will get to cast their vote uh, to make that choice. Uh, but whoever they choose, as I say, will face a rather overflowing intray on their first day in office, cost of living crisis, NHS waiting lists and the war in Ukraine, just some of the huge issues they'll have to deal with as Prime Minister. In 11 days' time, we will know who has won. But before those final votes are cast, tonight Conservative Party members here in this room will get the chance to ask them any questions they want. And I will also get to put some of my own questions too. So let's get straight down to business. The first candidate you're going to hear from this evening is the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. But first, let's hear from one of his supporters. Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Steve Barclay. Well, good evening, everyone. As uh, East of England MP, it's great to see so many of our members here for our regional hustings in what is a packed room. And in meeting the significant challenge that our country faces, we need a Prime Minister with the courage and tenacity who will act decisively and bring people with us. Rishi Sunak, as I know from first-hand experience, is the person with these qualities. And he has the capability and experience to lead the country through the difficult times ahead. Rishi showed courage when, as a comparatively new MP, he was warned against supporting Brexit. However, he and I have both been consistent supporters before, during, and after the referendum. He has demonstrated the ability to act decisively and deliver in the most challenging of national circumstances. When the pandemic struck, he was not bound by Treasury orthodoxy, but instead calmly and decisively devised policies such as the furlough scheme and the self-employed income support scheme that save millions of jobs and thousands of businesses. Indeed, there will be people in this room and many more watching these proceedings whose livelihoods were secured by the furlough or the self-employment scheme or the other measures that Rishi put in place. Support that was delivered quickly, decisively, and along with many other areas such as culture, art, sports, protected essential services within our communities. And indeed, whilst many now forget this, at the time unemployment was forecast to rise to 12%. As a result of the measures Rishi took, it has stayed consistently below 4%. And Rishi has been up front with the British public. In the pandemic, he made it clear that he could not save every job or every business. And in this leadership contest, he has set out to people what they need to know, talking about the huge inflationary pressures that we face and not what they may like to hear. For we know that nothing destroys prosperity more than inflation. Nothing destroys prosperity more than inflation. And it's no surprise that figures like Nigel Lawson, who helped tame inflation once before, has endorsed Rishi and trusted him to do so again. From our time together in the Treasury, I know that Rishi understands that levelling up is about more than the north of England. The east, our region, also needs to be levelled up too. The super deduction tax relief has benefited many of our small and medium businesses here. 
investment in key sectors like our life sciences and targeted support for the hardest hit by cost of living pressures have all been and continue to be crucial to our region. And with his family background, Rishi also understands the importance of the NHS, including the role of pharmacies and community some services, something that I fought hard for and I know he personally strongly supports. Rishi has demonstrated courage in the face of pressure, tenacity and ability to deliver at a time of national challenge and the willingness to communicate what needs to be done, in particular recognizing the risks that inflation poses to us all. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor amongst fellow conservatives to be able to introduce Rishi Sunak. Traditional conservative values are clear. Hard work, patriotism, fairness, a love of family, pragmatism, but also an unshakable belief that we can build a better future. We need a Prime Minister with experience of dealing successfully with huge problems. Throughout this campaign, he's made the right call that we should target inflation and help people with these massive energy costs. And I know he's got what it takes, the judgment, the grip, and the popular reach around the country. I hope that you will join with me in voting for Rishi Sunak. Please welcome Rishi Sunak. Good evening. Thank you. Great. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Really good. Thank you for having me. I must say, we've done, gosh, there's 11 of these. First time we've had a disco ball, I've noticed. So thank you, CCHQ. Brilliant stuff. Um, look, I am standing here in front of you tonight because our country did something really extraordinary for my family. It welcomed them here as immigrants years ago and allowed them to build a better life. Now, I was raised with a few simple values. First among those is that family means everything to me. And that's because we know as conservatives, don't we, that the bonds of family are far greater than anything any government could ever hope to replicate. Now, in my family, we prioritized hard work as the way to forge a better future. And my dad was an NHS GP. My mum ran the local chemist where I grew up in Southampton. And I spent all my spare time working in her shop delivering prescriptions to their patients, and doing her books, seeing the power of that small business to provide jobs in our local community. Now, my parents believed there was one thing above all else that could help provide their three children with a better future, and it was simple. It was through education. And that's why today I passionately believe that the best way that we reduce inequality, the best way that we spread opportunity Indeed, the best way that we transform people's lives is by ensuring that the birthright of every child is a world-class education. And that, in a nutshell, are my values. Patriotism, family, hard work, service. And I know as I look at you that those are your values too, and that's because they are conservative values. ...to build a better Britain. But how are we going to do that? Well, I believe we need to do three things, ladies and gentlemen. First, we must restore trust. Next, we need to rebuild the economy. And then we need to reunite our country. Now, when it comes to restoring trust, for me, that starts with honesty. And as you can see in this leadership race, I've not chosen to say the things that people may like to hear. I've said the things that I believe our country needs to hear. And even though that doesn't make my life easy, it is honest, and that is what leadership is all about. But we'll also restore trust by delivering on the things that matter to people. That's why I've set out a plan to finally start reforming the NHS, 
because it's not just about constantly throwing more money at it. We need to reform it and get more efficient healthcare out of it. It's why I want to take on this lefty woke culture that seems to want to cancel our history, our values, and our women. It's It's why I want to restore trust in our rural communities, like mine at home in North Yorkshire, and yours here in East Anglia. And that means increasing the supply of British food, protecting agricultural land, and unequivocally backing British farmers. And, and it's why I've set out a radical plan to finally get to grips with illegal migration. Because I stand here as a product of our country's proud, compassionate history in welcoming people to our shores. But it must be done legally. It must be done fairly. And we turn on our TV screens and see people coming here breaking those rules. That undermines trust in the system, and it's wrong. With my plan, we will finally get to grips with it and fix it restore trust, and ensure that we have proper control of our borders. When it comes to rebuilding the economy, you all know that the number one challenge is inflation, because inflation is the enemy. It makes everyone poorer. It eats into people's hard-earned savings, their pensions, pushes up mortgage rates. Now, this autumn and winter, I want to make sure that we help people with the cost of living, not just by cutting VAT on energy bills, but by going further to directly support the most vulnerable in our society and pensioners, because that's what a compassionate conservative government must do at a time like this. But what I will not do, ladies and gentlemen, is pursue policies that risk making inflation far worse and last far longer, especially if those policies amount to borrowing 50 billion pounds and putting that on the country's credit card and then asking our kids and our grandkids to pick up the tab because that is not right, it's not responsible and it is certainly not conservative. <laughs> now, of course, I'm going to cut your taxes, but I'm going to do that responsibly, by being tough on public spending and by growing our economy. And that's why this autumn I'm going to radically change how we tax businesses in this country, rewarding those businesses with tax cuts when they are actually investing and expanding for those businesses that are innovating to create the products and services of the future. Because with my business, I know that that's how you drive growth in a modern economy. Those are the tax cuts that are actually going to work. And as someone who was proud to support Brexit, we need to make sure that we capitalize on it. And that means finally getting on with cutting EU red tape. Now, that's why I came up with a radical new Brexit policy of free ports to attract jobs and investment to our country and put one right here in the east of England. But we need to go further and be radical across the board. And as Chancellor, when I invested in spreading broadband to places like this, investing in transport infrastructure, in communities like Great Yarmouth, Norwich, Kings Lynn. Because for me, levelling up is not just about big cities. It's not just about the North. Leveling up is for everyone, including right here in East Anglia. Now, in two years' time, when we have to reunite our country, we have to do something that's never been done before. We have to make British political history, in fact, by winning a fifth general election in a row. Now, even though that's never been done, I know that working together, all of us, we can do it. But it's going to require us to appeal to swing voters everywhere. In the north, in the south, in rural areas, urban areas, liberal areas, labour areas, Brexit areas, Remain areas, in Wales and in Scotland. And I passionately believe, and the evidence supports, that I am the candidate 
that offers our party the best opportunity of beating Labour and ensuring that Keir Starmer never walks through the door of number 10 Downing Street. Now, in conclusion, I'll just say this. As Chancellor, you saw me in the pandemic acting radically to successfully safeguard our economy through the biggest shock it had seen in 300 years. Now, as your Prime Minister, I promise you that I will apply that same urgency and grip to tackling all of our challenges and building a better Britain. A Britain where our kids can walk safely on the streets at night. A Britain where the NHS is reformed and there for everyone when we need. A Britain where our schools and apprenticeships are the envy of the world in providing opportunity. And a Britain where our economy is the most dynamic it has ever been with our businesses investing and innovating to create jobs across the nation. But I also promise you this, perhaps more importantly, that I will give you my all to ensure that each and every one of you here tonight can always feel enormously proud of the Conservative government that I will be privileged to lead. So I humbly ask for your support, not just to be your next party leader, but also the next prime minister of our great country. Thank you. Well, we've heard uh, from Rishi Sunak. Thank you very much indeed to him. In just a moment, we're going to speak, uh, hear from uh, Liz Truss. Uh, first of all, I just want to ask uh, in this audience, we can see a lot of people with their T-shirts and holding up their placards. We know who they are going to vote for or have voted for. Can I have a show of hands from everybody? Who here has already cast their vote? Hands up. It's an awful lot of you. Who here has not yet cast their vote? Now. Very interesting reaction from everyone there as well. There's an awful lot of people, I'd say the majority in the room, have not cast their vote. And of the people who haven't cast your vote, how many of you are still undecided? That's a lot of hands still going up there. Uh, that shows it's still very much all to play for, despite what some of the polls have said. Let's remember, those polls aren't always quite as trustworthy as people seem to think. Right, so let's get on now. Let's hear from uh, the Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, of course. But first of all, let's hear from one of her supporters. Please welcome Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Therese Coffey. <laughs> Friends... Fellow Conservatives, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce my friend, Liz Truss, to you tonight. While we have been friends since we entered Parliament together in 2010, what I have always admired about Liz is her intellect, her integrity, and her instinct. And that is why I am backing Liz for leader of our party and Prime Minister of our great country. Of course, here in Norfolk, in East Anglia, Liz doesn't really need introduction as she'd been the Member of Parliament for South West Norfolk since 2010. Fast off the block, she became a campaign winning champion for her constituents, improving educational attainment, securing the A11 upgrade and better trains, promoting food and farming, and of course her successful campaign to keep the RAF in Norfolk with Make It Marham. Liz's talent was quickly recognised and used as she moved into ministerial life in 2012 and now has served in the cabinet continuously for the last eight years. Her vast experience of a decade as a minister is impressive on both delivery and determination to make things better for the people she represents, whether in East Anglia or right across the United Kingdom. That determination has shone through as foreign secretary in standing up to Putin and his invasion of Ukraine working hand in glove with the Prime Minister and the Defence Secretary. Even when this leadership contest started, Liz was doing her duty going to the other side of the world to accelerate the accession of Sweden and Finland to NATO. She really has played her part in making sure that we stand up for Ukraine. That shows, I believe, how much she cares 
about duty and doing the right thing. These are serious times. And Liz is a serious person who will stand up for what is right, whether that is Ukraine or indeed our United Kingdom. A child of the Union, she stood up in terms of keeping the integrity of the Union to fully include Northern Ireland, putting peace and the Good Friday Agreement ahead of our trade deal with the EU. But knowing Liz, I know she'll deliver that Northern Ireland Protocol. She has also forged new trade deals around the world, which is to keep both growth and tackling the cost of living. In 2019, um, we Conservatives, through Boris Johnson, secured a large majority and a clear mandate for our manifesto. But with the aftershock of COVID and the ongoing energy challenge created by Putin, we now face a clear choice on our economic way forward. I support Liz in that we need to go for growth, a combination of stopping further tax rises and tackling unnecessary red tape will unlock growth. That is key, as well as tackling inflation and facing into the cost of living challenge that families face. I believe Liz can do that. Intellect, integrity, instinct. Back Liz for leader, you can trust her to deliver. The United Kingdom is a great country. And I know that a United Conservative Party can unleash the potential of all the people who make our country so great. To win the next election, we need to deliver, deliver, and deliver for the British people. I know that our country's best days lie ahead. I'm the candidate with a clear vision for the future who can drive change and get things done. As Trade Secretary, I negotiated deals with allies like Australia and Japan, creating opportunities around the world for British business. And as Prime Minister, I will continue to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. I will lead a government committed to core Conservative principles, low taxes, a firm grip on spending, driving growth in the economy, and giving people the opportunity to achieve anything they want to achieve, regardless of their background. I will work day and night to lead a party and a government that puts more money in your pocket and secures a better life for you and your family. I've consistently delivered when I have said I would. And I love our country. I want the best for us all. And I'm the person to deliver that. Please welcome Liz Truss. Hi. It's fantastic to be here in Norwich. We've travelled around the entire United Kingdom, but there is nothing better than being back here in my adopted county of Norfolk. Yeah. Because in Norfolk, we do different. <laughs> We're a county of entrepreneurs, of pioneers, of mould breakers. We've had brilliant successes, and we've got things done. But my friends, isn't it time we had a Norfolk Member of Parliament back in number 10 Downing Street? I, I apologise to uh, Suffolk and Essex members of this audience, sorry about that. Now, I'm not from a traditional Conservative background. I grew up in Paisley in Scotland and in Leeds in Yorkshire and I went to a comprehensive school. And what I saw at my school is I saw some children being let down, being let down by low expectations because they were from a different background, being let down by Leeds City Council, who cared more about political correctness than they did about all children learning English and maths, and being let down by a lack of opportunities in the area. And I didn't think things had to be like that. I wanted a Britain where everybody had opportunities, regardless of their background, regardless of where they came from. I want us to be an aspiration nation. Yeah. But let's be honest, we are facing very difficult times. We have the appalling war in Ukraine perpetrated by Putin. We have the aftermath of the COVID crisis. And we also have 
an energy price spike. We've had two decades of relatively low growth here in Britain. So now is not the time for business as usual. Now is the time to do different and to be different. And I have that plan. I have a plan to grow our economy. First of all, we need to get all of those EU laws off our statute books by the end of 2023. We need to take advantage of those post-Brexit opportunities. And we need, you know, that will unlock huge investment, whether it's into agri-tech, whether it's into financial services, technology, energy, right across the east of England. Next, we need to cut taxes. We shouldn't have put up national insurance. We promise not to in our manifesto. And we can still afford, by cutting national insurance, to pay the debt down starting in three years' time. I'd also have a moratorium on the green energy levy. So we immediately cut money from people's fuel bills. And I would keep corporation tax low. Because if we raise corporation tax to the same level as France and 10 points higher than Ireland, we're not going to attract the investment. We're not going to attract the jobs. We're not going to get the growth that we need in this country. And fundamentally, as conservatives, we need to be on the side of people who work hard and do the right thing. Amen. People who are self-employed, people who set up their own businesses, people who go out to work every day. That's why I would legislate straight away to stop militant trade unions disrupting our railways and make sure they are providing essential services. <laughs> now, before I was an MP, I was a councillor. And I know, looking around this audience, there are many councillors I know. And as a councillor, I sat on a planning committee. And those are hours of my life I will never get back. <laughs> because you all know that you sit there on a the committee, you think that you can make decisions, but you get overruled by the planning inspectorate in Bristol, or you get told what to do by the people in Whitehall. I would immediately legislate to remove the top-down housing targets. And I would level up in a conservative way by setting up low-tax investment zones where local communities want them, driving business growth and investment. And I'll also take on the Treasury orthodoxy, the rules that currently mean that more investment goes into areas that already have the investment. Now, we all know it's very hard to get a mobile phone signal near here. <laughs> it's hard to get your broadband fixed. And we've been waiting far too long to have the A47 jeweled and the Ely North Junction built. Yeah. And I will... I will take on, I will take on that orthodoxy. I'll also back our farmers, because we are one of the most productive agricultural areas in the whole country. And what we want is we want our farmers producing food, not solar panels. And we want to make sure that they're farming, not filling in forms. And that is what I would do. Now, one of the reasons that we're facing this food insecurity and this energy crisis is Vladimir Putin's appalling war in Ukraine. And what I would do is continue to stand up to Putin, and I'm proud of the record we have so far, because we were the first European country to send weapons to Ukraine. And we put the toughest sanctions on Russia of any country in the world. But we need to do more. I'm proud that we across Norfolk campaigned for RAF Marham, the Make It Marham campaign. And we kept the tornadoes in this county and we secured the Joint Strike Fighter. But, but we can't be complacent about our defence. And that is why I would increase our defence spending to 3% of GDP by the end of this decade. I'll also tackle the small boats in the English Channel. 
I, I worked with Priti on the Rwanda policy. We need to make it work, and we need to expand it to more countries. And I would legislate to make sure that we cannot be overruled by the ECHR. We should make decisions about our own borders. But as well as fighting for freedom and democracy around the world, I think we need a bit more of it here at home. <laughs> and I have shown that I'm somebody who's prepared to take on the identity politics of the left. And I'm prepared to be honest and say what's true. I'm a plain speaking Yorkshire woman. And I'm very clear that a woman is a woman. And I will make sure we protect our single sex spaces. And what I will also do is stand up for the United Kingdom. There are too many people in this country who say we should be ashamed of our past, that we aren't the country we were, that we're somehow in decline. Those people are wrong. I see as Foreign Secretary that people love the United Kingdom. They love what we stand for, freedom and democracy. And we need to be as proud of ourselves as others see us. Now, in 2019, we won a huge majority. And we won seats across the country, including seats here like Peterborough, like Ipswich, and like North Norfolk. And the reason people voted for us in those seats isn't because they wanted the Labour Party, it's not because they wanted the Liberal Democrats. It's because they wanted conservative policies. Yeah. Because they wanted more enterprise, more opportunities, personal responsibility. But what we now have to do is we have to deliver on those promises. And I'm somebody who's shown I can deliver. I don't take no from an answer from anyone. And I have pushed things through Whitehall. Whether it's the dozens of trade deals people said we couldn't do, whether it's the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which was controversial in some parts, but will help restore the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, I am prepared to do what it takes to make things happen. And that's what people in Britain need. Because when we show that we are positive about our country, when we show we're delivering, that is why people will support us at the next election, and not yet another North London Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, he doesn't understand aspiration. He doesn't understand what people in this country want. So what I would do as Prime Minister is I would deliver for everybody across our country. I'd make sure it happens. And I will win the next election in 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Right, all very lively. Very big thank you to Liz Truss there. Now, you've heard from both of the two candidates. It's time for some questions and hopefully some answers too. It's not PMQs and House of Commons. We're actually going to get some answers. In a few minutes, I will hand over to you, the audience here in Norwich, uh, to put their poses to the contenders. But very first up, it's my turn to ask my question. So please, uh, let's uh, uh, get uh, some proper answers to some tough questions. Some of those are suggested by from some of my Talk TV audience as well. So I've very much been looking forward to this. Please uh, welcome back Rishi Sunak. <laughs> Great, thank you. Lovely. Right then. Right, we've just got uh, we've got 12 minutes. We're going to go to the audience, so let's get straight to it. Um, tomorrow, off Gem, they're going to confirm the energy price cap for an average home from October. It's going to rise to £3,550. Next summer, it could be £6,000 a year. Uh, it's not just low earners who won't be able to afford to pay that. It's going to be millions of those hard-working families we hear that politicians care so much about and want their votes. Um, the help that you and both those trusts as well have actually publicly uh, promised so far isn't going to be enough. Isn't it time that you squared with Tory party members, but also the British public, uh, that what you're offering publicly is far less than what you're actually really going to have to do and tell them how much it's going to cost? Well, 
Julia, without doubt, that's the most pressing challenge facing the country. It's something I've been talking about for a while. Inflation in general, energy bills in particular, and millions of families are going to have a very tough time this autumn and winter. And I don't, I don't think anyone can say that what I've said is not enough because I haven't put a precise amount on it because it's hard to do that until, A, we know what the numbers are, and B, once we're in office. But what I have set out is a very clear framework for how I'm going to help people and who's going to get the most help. Now, I, I think we're all, we're all grown-ups here, we all know that in a situation like this, there's no government, there's no prime minister who could sit here and say, yep, we can make all of this go away as if it's not going to feel anything, no one's going to feel anything, that's just simply not credible. I don't think anyone here believes that that's possible. That, that's, that's the problem with inflation, it makes people poorer, and pretending otherwise is not being straight with everyone. But what we can do is target our help on the people who need it most in a circumstance like that. So what I've said is the following. I've announced a lot of support as Chancellor, um, which is significant and was acknowledged as being so. And I've said very clearly that I'll go further as Prime Minister. And there's three... It's not just going to be the very poorest who so need I'm, help. I'm just going to explain what we're doing and, and then people can okay. decide what they would do differently or not. And that's... There is already support for everybody that's in place, uh, and I would go further by cutting VAT off energy bills to provide further additional support to everybody uh, universally, so that will amount to several hundred pounds in total. Uh, but for two other groups of people, I think we should and must go further, uh, and that's those on the lowest incomes, which covers about a third of our country, and for pensioners people on fixed incomes, which is similarly another third of all households. Now, those groups of people are particularly vulnerable. They don't have the means to fall back on to deal with it. And if we don't do something specific for those people, there's a high risk that millions of people will fall into destitution. Okay. Now, my, my plan is to provide direct financial support to those groups of people. I announced it as Chancellor. I would up those amounts as Prime Minister. They'll receive that cash in the autumn and the winter. And that's the right thing to do. And, and there's a big point of difference on this between Liz and I because her approach is tax cuts. And they don't help those people, right? If you're someone working in cabinet, you know, that's probably worth about £1,700, that tax cut. If you're someone working on a reasonably low wage, it's worth about a pound a week. And if you're a pensioner who's not working, it's worth precisely zero. Okay. So I think you do need to have great okay. support for those people. Time. Time is very tight. What help are you going to give to businesses? Because businesses don't get uh, the advantage of the price cap. We're looking at some hospitality businesses and others facing a 300% increase in their energy costs already. That's before uh, they continue to go up. What help are you going to give to them? Because when they start going under and closing up shop, we're going to be in a much more difficult situation employment yeah, no, wise. I, I, that's, that's clearly something that the new Prime Minister will have to look at. I, no, and I'll have to look at it, and I'm happy to do so and would do so. Uh, well, I think look, you talk about the hospitality industry. I think one thing I'm, I'm pretty confident on is that people can judge me by my record. And it was the hospitality industry that suffered almost the most out of any sector during COVID. And I think most people in the hospitality industry would acknowledge that I found the way to make sure I supported them through it because I recognize the value that they play in our communities and employing millions of people. So I think they're a very important part of our economy, important part of our communities, and I've got a very strong track record in supporting the hospitality sector, and that's what I would do as Prime Minister. Okay. Um, energy needs to be reliable, secure, and affordable. Right now, our energy supply isn't, I think we can all agree, any of those. Um, and it can't be, while the government's committed to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, I would suggest. Do you agree? that net zero is an unremitting disaster for this country, and will you abandon the policy? No. I think that... <laughs> uh, I don't. Uh, I, no, I, I, I don't think that's right. And if you look at one of the cheapest forms of energy that we are now using, it's, it's uh, renewable energy, right? It has and that's backed up by gas. We don't have the gas storage. Yeah, I, we don't have gas storage, and we need to invest in it. Whose decision I think... was that? Well, I, but it wasn't mine. I wasn't in government, <laughs> right? So, uh, so uh, but we do need more gas storage. But look, I, I think these two things are compatible, right? And you know, we, we have to get to net zero. It's important that we protect the legacy of our environment that we leave to our children and our grandchildren. As much as I care about the financial legacy we leave them, I care about the environment that we leave them. I think that's an entirely conservative instinct. But we need to do it in a positive way. We need to do it in a way that brings people along with us. Uh, and that means innovation. 
right, in a word. Like I talked about the economy that I want to build. I want to build an economy that's built on innovation because the way we're going to do it in a positive way is by creating the new forms of technology that will help us, small modular reactors, for example, that can provide clean, renewable, secure energy at affordable prices, which we're developing right here in the UK. As you said, new forms of energy storage. There's lots of things that we can do that will help us get to net zero and actually over time lower bills and create jobs in the UK. That's my vision of how we get there, but it would be, I think, politically a major mistake for us to abandon net zero and think that we can try and win the next election. I just don't think that that is right. Okay. Um, this week we saw a nine-year-old girl shot dead in her own home amid drug gang wars. Uh, we also saw 1,300 illegal migrants arriving in dinghies from France in just one day, indeed on the same day. Um, we've lost control of our streets, we've lost control of our borders. When did the Tory party stop being the party of law, of law and order? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this, the story about Olivia, her name was, is shocking. And I was asked about it the other day. I mean, my, my daughter is the same age. And the thought that that could happen in your own home, let alone on the streets, is just appalling. And I think all of our hearts will go out to, to her family at this time. Now, what can we do about things like that to stop them from happening? But you're right, we need to put more police officers on the street. We're in the process of doing that. We also need to make sure that they have the tools they need to actually keep us safe. And um, one thing that concerns me as I've been campaigning around the country is it's clear that you know, there are elements in our police forces that are held back from doing the things that I think they want to do that would actually keep us safe uh, because of an ideology, right? And we talked about this wokish ideology and you know, stop and search is a good example of a technique that works that police forces are not always using for, for reasons that are not right. And all I'll say to you, that whether it comes to another thing that we don't tackle which affects young girls, that's the issue of grooming gangs which I've been very clear that we must tackle. And we all know why we don't talk about it. It's not right. And I've got a plan to get to grips with it. But what I'll tell everyone here is that I will never let political correctness stand in the way of keeping you and your family safe. That's the type of prime minister I do. Um, in an interview with The Spectator magazine today, you've revealed how the scientists advising the government on COVID were never properly challenged in government. There was no attempt to assess the likely damage that uh, would be caused by lockdowns to health, education, the economy, rather obviously. Uh, you said it was wrong for the government to scare people with their campaigns. You say you fought a lone battle behind the scenes against many of those measures. But um, why didn't you speak out publicly? Why didn't you expose what was going on? And if you felt so strongly, why didn't you resign? Because that, that wouldn't have been the responsible thing to, to do in the midst of a pandemic where I was engaged in making sure that I could safeguard our economy and protect millions of people's jobs and livelihoods and families from what was going on. Um, and and this, is, this is, remember, what I was talking about is the lessons we should learn. This is not to second guess the decisions we made at the time, which were extraordinarily difficult for everyone involved, right? I mean, everyone was doing their absolute best at the time. Uh, to do what they thought was right for the country. These were impossible decisions. But what I was talking about was, having now been through it and had the experience of it, what can we learn from it? And I think governments should always be trying to learn, look at what worked, what didn't, what we'd like to improve. And as I reflect on that period, you know, all I was reflecting on the fact is, I think when you're dealing with decisions like that, it's right to look at all aspects of the decision. Right? and to acknowledge that there are trade-offs. In the same way, right now, we're having a debate in this leadership race about the right approach to managing the economy, inflation, taxes, borrowing and spending. I think there are trade-offs. Right? I think you can't have everything. Right? You can't borrow lots of money, deliver lots of tax cuts, inflation will all be fine, nothing will happen to interest rates, and we can help people with the cost of living. I, I, I just think if something is, you know, sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I think it's right for leaders to acknowledge trade-offs, and that's what I was saying in that interview, that we should acknowledge the trade-offs that lockdown had, particularly with regard to our kids' education. And I think that's something that we as conservatives believe very strongly in. Education is the way we provide opportunity. And one of the, one of the most tragic things about lockdown was the damage done to our kids' education. And I think everyone in this room would agree that we never want to ever repeat that, because it, it's not something we want to do. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, the NHS is in crisis. It's in crisis, whether it's summer or winter, it's always in crisis. Millions of people waiting months, waiting hours even, uh, to get an ambulance to get into A&E. We're a first world country. Why don't we have a first world, first class health service? And what are you going to do to make that happen? Well, I think, I think the first thing to say is I, there will be many people here, as there are people across the country, that do receive 
first-class care from the NHS, right? And it's wrong, and I, I, I'm wrong to say that like it's, it's not as if it's not working at all, right? So we should recognize that when it works really well, it's extraordinary. I mean, it really is extraordinary when the NHS works well. That's why it's the country's most prized public service. And I think we as a party need to always remember that, right? And we're not going to win elections if people don't think we can be trusted with the NHS, right? And that's why I did a difficult thing to, to raise money to help fund not just the NHS, but social care, which for too long has been the poor cousin. But where I do agree is that money can't be the only answer, right? We're conservatives. We don't just keep throwing money at the problem. That's just not going to work. We do need to be bold and radical in reforming it. And you know, I've, I've been talking about lots of ideas that I have to do that, but I'll give you an example of one, uh, and that's to tackle this issue of missed NHS appointments, which we all know about. And last year, do you know what? 15 million missed appointments in the NHS. You 15 million in, 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 well, well, this is the thing. It would be, it, it's not the biggest issue in the NHS. No, I, that, so I think you are, I think you are, I think you're completely wrong. 15 million missed appointments in hospitals and in, and in GPs. So if we had a system which was tougher on people for missing appointments, and it's not about making money from them, it's about changing the culture, so that's unacceptable. Because if we do that and people cancel them in advance, what have we done? We've just created lots more healthcare for everybody. We get the backlogs down quicker with no more tax pay. I'm, I'm jumping in because time is tight. We want to get to your questions, but at last, uh, uh, I want to ask some quick fire questions. Very short answers, some of them one word answers, please. Um, 12 years in power under the Tories. Can you name me a single public service in this country that works well? I thought furlough scheme did okay. It's not. <laughs> well, we don't have works well is anywhere there's a Conservative councillor or Conservative PCC okay. in charge, lots of them there. Okay. President Macron, friend I'd or see, foe? I see John Fuller somewhere over there. Where is he? There he is. President Macron, friend or foe? Friend. Police officers, dancing the Macarena or investigating crimes? I mean, clearly fighting crime. Uh, mask mandates or no mask mandates? No. Uh, yes or no. Is a trans woman a woman? No. Uh, the BBC, Tory bias or Labour bias or uh, studiously neutral? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's no woke bias uh, option in there. Uh, no, look, I, I, look, the One BBC... One word answer. No, 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 look, the, the BBC is a proud British institution, right? And it's easy to bash the BBC in that. And clearly, if I did that, everyone would clap and that'd be fine. But, look, I, you know, look, I, I actually think the BBC... <laughs> the BBC is a proud... Uh, the BBC is, a, is, is something that everyone in this country is actually proud of, but it's right that it reflects the values of everyone in this country. And so, that is what, so that is, what is not done. It's not about okay. Labour or Conservative. Right, it's we'll about reflecting the values. It maybe actually is rural communities or urban okay. communities, quite Who frankly. would you rather be stuck in a lift with, Keir Starmer or Nicola Sturgeon? <laughs> Gosh. Um, crikey. I'll have to hurry you. Yeah, I... I, I yeah, I know. I was going to yeah, take the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and finally, if not you, who would make a better Prime Minister, Boris Johnson or Liz Truss? Oh, gosh. I mean, Liz, Liz Truss. We're, we're here in her hometown, and regardless of that, or home area, look, we've got to move forward as a party. Right, and I know actually this is lots of you here. I'm sure you know upset with me for resigning. You wish Boris was here. That is not going to help us move forward, right? It is simply not. We have got to move forward as a party. And when this is over, like we're all on the same team, we're all on the same family. We've got to focus on beating Keir Starmer, and we're not going to do that if we're looking backwards. We've got to look forward. Okay. And that's all we've got to right. The end of my set of questions. Now it's turned for you here. A Tory party members in Norwich get to ask questions. Where are my microphones, please? Uh, microphone, uh, microphones there at the back. Um, but can we get someone at the back first of all and then get a microphone over to the front as soon as we can? A um, gentleman gentleman over the there, yes, with a white somewhere. shirt on. Keep your questions if you can. If you could say who you are and keep them as brief as possible, I'd be very grateful. Hi there, I'm Anthony. I'm a head teacher at a school here in Norwich. I want to ask you, without platitudes or without sound bites, to give me one, two, three things that you could do to make the lives of particularly disadvantaged students better in this country? Yeah, uh, so I'll give you three things I want to do because I think education is the most important way that we can transform people's lives. I mentioned that in my speech, I genuinely believe it. It's the conservative way to spread opportunity around and it's the thing that I will be proud to spend most of my time focusing on if I have the opportunity. So look, three things we need to do. First is I want to look at the curriculum in our schools, particularly 
at what we allow kids to study at 18. We are pretty much the only advanced economy in the world that lets our children give up maths and English at 16. I don't think that is probably right, and I think we're not preparing them for the jobs of the future by doing that, particularly disadvantaged kids. So I want to look at curriculum reform at that level. Second thing is apprenticeships because there are lots of good routes into fantastic careers these days. It can't just be about university, and we need to increase both the breadth and quality of apprenticeships and make them available. And, and the, last, the last one, which applies to people from all backgrounds, but is for us to stop thinking about education as something that finishes at 18 or 21. Because now, in a modern economy, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, or 60s, People are going to want to train, pick up a new skill, get a new qualification to get a better job to support their family. We've got to have an education system that is supporting them when they want to do that. And that, in a nutshell, is the education system that I want to build for you. I want it to be the envy of the world, and that's a conservative way to spread opportunity and transform lives. Okay, thank you for that. Oh, it has a badge on. Good evening. My name's Steve. Uh, if I could take you briefly back to your opening speech. Uh, how would you restore trust and... Um, Finally, control our borders. Right, um, right. Two, two questions, but they're two important ones. Yeah. So, look, controlling borders, as I said, is really important, right? And I've put a, for those of you interested, I've got a 10 point plan on my website. Have a look at it. Uh, there's a video there. I'll give you just a couple of things from it in the interest of time. Uh, the first is we've got to move away from the European definition of asylum because it is simply too broad and allows far too many people to stay here who shouldn't be here, and there's different international legal standards we can use, and I would quickly move us to those, and that will make a big difference. Second thing is we need to toughen up our foreign policy. At the moment, we'll go to a country, try and talk to them about a trade deal. We may even give them international aid, but we won't at the same time insist that they take back their failed asylum seekers. Now, that's clearly wrong, right? And we need to be tougher about linking those things, because if we don't, we don't do whatever it takes to fix this problem that I will, it's costing all of us, right? Five million pounds a day. All of you, five million pounds a day in hotel costs for housing all these people. So not only do we need to get control of our borders for security to restore trust, we also need to do it so that we can start cutting taxes and spend money on the things that we want to. My plan is online and it will deliver for you. But can I just, um, can, very quickly, actually, because you asked another question about trust, which is important, right? Yeah, no, but there's, because they, 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 you're briefly. right. Very, very briefly, look, I, you know, I, I, I think standards matter, and that's why I would actually very quickly, as Prime Minister, reappoint an independent advisor on ministerial ethics, because I think it sends a very strong signal, and that person should have the powers and resources to hold people to account. But I also say this, if we're going to appeal to these swing voters that we need to everywhere, by definition, they're not ideological, these people. They're not natural Tories. They're not natural Labour supporters. What they want is a government that works properly above anything else. And I will run a government that is conducted competently, that is conducted seriously, and with decency and integrity at the heart of everything it does. That is the change I'm going to bring. That's the Prime Minister I'm going to be. And that's how we're going to restore trust and win the next election. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask a favour? When you've put your hand up, can you keep your hand up so I can direct a microphone to you? Otherwise, it's impossible. Um, would you mind waiting? Can we, oh, this gentleman just over here with his hand up over here with the microphone, I think. Oh, someone over there with the microphone anyway. Ah, there you are. Uh, Richie, we rely on our armed forces in every crisis. Over decades now, they've been cut to the bone. It's too late once a threat becomes a reality. What are you going to do to enhance our defence capabilities? Yes, well, thank you for the question, sir, and you're right. Uh, look, so I, as Chancellor, together with the Prime Minister and Defence Secretary, put in place the largest uplift to defence spending since the end of the Cold War. Right? That's my record. That's why I did. We did it in the middle of the pandemic, in fact, because the threats to our country were increasing, as you highlighted, and we needed to make sure that we were protected against those. Now, in th terms of going forward, what does that mean? Well, it means we need to be thinking about our threats in an intelligent way, because the threats are not the same ones we used to face. Actually, we have a threat now from countries like China trying to infiltrate our companies and steal technology, right? So we need to do what I did as chancellor, pass a law that allows us to block that type of investment. We need to make sure that we're building resilient supply chains for the critical minerals that are gonna power all the electric cars that we might be driving one day to not be reliant on hostile countries. Those are the new types of threats that we also need to be far-sighted about. But look, when it comes to investing in our armed forces, look, I, 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 will, I will of course continue to do that. If Liz is here, she, as she probably said in her speech, she'll invest 3% of GDP on defense. Now, I'm not gonna say that, not because I don't believe 
in investing in our armed forces. Of course, I do, and my record demonstrates that. It's just I don't believe in arbitrary targets when it comes to something as serious as the security of our realm. So the commitment I would make to you is that I will invest whatever it takes to make sure that we keep you, your families, and our country safe, because that is the first duty of a prime minister. Thank you, Doug. Um, lady here, I think we can guess who you're going to vote for by your T-shirt. Yeah. Hi, Rishi. My name's Mia. I run an alternative provision for trauma-informed and attachment-based interventions. It's not enough to just work with education because there are still so many children not accessing full-time education. What are you going to do to, with the social care to, to, to support families so that children have a better start so they can actually access education in the first place? Yeah, well, Mia, thank you for the work that you do, which obviously is transformative for for those families. Uh, you were right about social care, to mention it. You know what people, when people think about the pressure when they hear social care and our social care system is under pressure and they hear that from our counsellors as well, what people don't realise actually is that half of the social care budget in this country isn't spent on elderly people. It's actually spent on people of working age, the children that you have a privilege of looking after and supporting. So when I said I was going to raise this extra money to put money into social care, it's to also support you in the work that you do. Because the pressures that our councils are under are significant. And I think all of us want the children, particularly those vulnerable children, to have the dignity of fulfilling lives with the same opportunities as much as possible that all the rest of us enjoyed. Uh, and that's why I did what I did. That's why I focused also on special educational needs funding, uh, aided by John and his colleagues lobbying me hard uh, in the budget time. But it's also why, in a completely different way, when I was local government minister, I prioritised something called changing places, toilets. Right? And these are children with complex disabilities for whom a typical disabled toilet is not sufficient because there's no changing bench or a hoist. And they suffer the indignity of having to be changed on car parks, dirty supermarket floors, or not supermarkets, but anywhere. And I didn't think that was right. So we changed the building regulations to make sure we put those in. I created a small fund by saving money elsewhere. And we're massively increasing the provision of those uh, changing places toilets now. It's a simple, practical thing. But like you, I wanted those children to have the dignity and opportunity that the rest of us take for granted. It's a very noble aim, and thank you for doing what you do. Thank you very much for that. Uh, lady over here. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Jane Rishi. Um, I'm very heartened to hear what both of you have had to say about supporting our farmers. Um, I've heard less about supporting our fishermen, um, and obviously a uh, big concern is trawlers and all that sort of thing, so our fish stocks and our fishermen, and I feel as though that's one of the elements that was a, such an opportunity we were yeah. hoping for after Brexit, and how can we get them wrapped back and sort yeah, them out? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, you're right. Um, and look, I, 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 first thing is to actually, the first thing to say is, is to acknowledge that some of our fishing communities do feel a bit let down, right? I think the first thing we should just be honest about that. They feel that they did not get as good a deal as they were hoping for, and I accept that, and I, I, I sympathise with it. So, look, the, what I say to them is, look, the job is not done, right? Now, we're going to come and renegotiate all these quotas in a few years' time, and we need to be robust about that. And without getting into all the details of with pelagic stocks and this, that, and the other, where we need to focus, like, there's clearly some specific things that we need to try and correct. Because some of the quota share that we've got at the moment, and this is getting technical for those who are really interested in this, it, it sounds good on paper, but in reality, we don't fish those, those stocks, and they're not actually there when, when, you, when you need them to be. So look, we do need to update. And the way we solve that problem is by updating all the scientific work on where our fish stocks actually are. And if we can do that work in advance of the negotiation, that will be really helpful. And in the meantime, we created a fisheries fund that I did as chancellor, which is supporting the community, supporting investment in new technology kit um, to help the communities become more productive. And Sorry? Very ah, well, look, on banning trawlers, there's actually lots of things, as you say, about fishing use. Also, also together, making sure that we balance the needs of things like renewable energy offshore with fishing needs. And that is something that we, are, we need to spend a bit more time on because there is clearly a competition for the same space and we need to manage those things a bit better. We've just a few moments left. Um, let's get to as many as we can. No, no, excuse, no excuse me, I'll decide who you are. No, sit down. Sit down, sir. Please, could you go to the gentleman over there? Sit down, sir. Gentleman over here, please. Good evening, Rishi. My name is Philip. Um, as a 
passionate conservative, I assume you're equally passionate about home ownership and the right for our future generations. You've stated on planning that you plan to ban development on Greenbelt. This harks back to the days of John Prescott and Tony Blair. It didn't work then. Can you please explain how your ban on Greenbelt is now going to deliver the housing that is desperately needed in, in our country? Yeah, so let me explain the, my approach to this. The, the, what I've said is, what I want to get, do away with is centrally imposed, Whitehall imposed, top-down targets on local communities. Because I don't think that works. I think local communities should be in charge of making sure they get the development right in their areas. So that's what I've said on that. And that means no inappropriate development on Greenbelt. But ultimately, local communities will know what's best for them. They should be the ones in the driving seat. But you're right to ask at the same time about housing supply. Because most people here will have remember what it felt like when we got the keys to our first flat, our first home, and how magical that felt, and then we built a family and a life there. That conservative dream, we need to make a reality for more people. So there's other ways we can increase housing supply. We need to densify in our urban areas. That's obvious. We need to do far more brownfield remediation, and the government's now putting more money to remediate almost a million sites over time. And we need to do something that my very good friend, uh, Richard has been talking about for years, and that is to overcome our British aversion to what we call flat pack housing, but the rest of the world calls modular housing, because it is very high quality, it is faster, and it is cheaper. And thanks to that man, we are doing more of it. Uh, but, but, if I, it's very important. The last thing, the last thing I'd say is also I want to look at the mortgage market, because many of you will, in this situation, will have kids or grandkids who are paying a lot in rent right now, right? And they're paying it very, very reliably. And in fact, they could afford a mortgage, right? They could afford a mortgage, and it may be that the mortgage payment is less than their rent payment if they could get one. I see lots of nodding. The problem is the deposit. So what I created as chancellor was a new 95% mortgage for young first-time buyers with a good credit history, and it's working really well. And as prime minister, I'd like to look at turbocharging that product, because if it works, we can help young people get on the housing ladder much faster and then ensure that dream that we all uh, experience can be a reality for a whole new generation of young people because that is what a conservative government has got to deliver isn't it but the reality is you're not going to get more people on the housing ladder unless we just build more houses well that's why the first three things yeah, i talked about were on the supply side yeah but we, and then we also have but to look if at we're allowing if, we, if we're going to have the nimby issue we're going to have the not here we, yes everyone wants more houses just not near them well that, that's why there's a million sites julia that are on brownfield land that we can remediate right a million sites our urban areas are nowhere near as dense as they could be compared to European cities. So that's not about building on Greenland and either of those things. And if we take up Richard's idea, we can deliver faster, cheaper housing in an incredibly beautiful way. He will show you these amazing pictures he's got from Switzerland, which are probably on his phone, uh, which we did great work together, actually, in government, right? And, and honestly, this is going to make a real difference to young first-time buyers, and Richard deserves enormous credit for it. Let's, let's take a question from a young man over here. Yep. My name's Tom. I'm a, a member in Norwich South. I've got two young children. My question is about crime. Um, given that 20,000 additional officers will only take police numbers back up to where they were in 2010, what else will you do as Prime Minister to get a grip of rising crime, which many people across the country feel is totally out of control? Yeah. So, I mean, look, it goes back to what I was saying before, uh, and that's making sure that not only do we put police officers on the street, but we give them the tools they need to actually combat crime. And that's not happening everywhere, right? I think we're, we're quite lucky in this part of the world. We have lots of conservative police and crime commissioners. But when I talk to police officers, as I said, across the country, it's making sure that A, they're freed up from not having to deal with a lot of bureaucracy on the one end, which we now make them do, which we should strip down so they can actually focus their time on fighting crime. And then secondly, it's breaking through some of these pervasive ideologies that mean that they don't use techniques which can actually solve the problem. And the last thing I'd say is this, right? Now, I'd give you this stat. Half of all convictions in our country are caused by a very small group of people, career criminals. So less than 10%, 9% of all criminals account for over half of all the crime. So no strategy for tackling crime is, is going to work unless we go after these people. And the average number of convictions these career criminals have is 19, right? Now, look, we're a compassionate party. We believe in giving people a second chance, maybe even a third chance, but certainly not a 19th chance, right? So we need to look at sentencing for those people because that will really help. Okay. Right. Final question, I'm afraid, from a lady over here. I believe Scott's microphone. 
Hello, my name's Leanne. My question is around green um, environmental issues. Obviously, that's becoming a big issue now. It is turning into a crisis. It is a crisis for the young generation. You've not really hugely touched on it. You've mentioned about the sea and having wind power there. Um, but what are you going to do? Are you going to hit big businesses? Um, because obviously the small people are doing their bit, but there's only so much we can do. So I, I, I completely agree. Look, I have two young girls who are, who are younger than you, and as I've said at these things, the only thing they ask me about, and you know, I had been Chancellor for two and a bit years, the only thing they care about asking me is, Daddy, what are you doing for the environment? And that's why I was saying we've got to be committed to net zero, and you heard it from me unequivocally. But the way we're going to get there is not by hitting anybody. Right? Whether it's big business or indeed families struggling with bills, we can't make this about making life more difficult for people. Right? It can't be about, well, you have to pay more for all these things, or you have to give up all these things that you love. We've got to use innovation and technology to solve these problems. British researchers, scientists, companies are going to help us solve this problem, and that's why we need to build the innovation economy that I talked about. And I'm confident if I get this job, I can build that type of economy, and it will be our country that leads the world in providing the new clean sources of energy that will help us get there so that your generation can inherit an environment in a better state than we found it. That's what I want to deliver for you and all your generation. Okay. Right, yeah, you're done. A big thank you. Um, that's all the questions we've got time for. For Rishi, you see now. Big thank you. Now, I hope you here in Norwich, in the hall, and also those at home will understand that I don't really want to take a whole load of questions from people who've got T-shirts on, uh, supported the candidate, they're taking questions. Still haven't made up your mind yet, still haven't cast your vote. So please, welcome back to the stage, Liz Truss. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Oh, very good to see you. Oh, she went for the media double kiss. Right. Okay. So it's uh, my chance to ask questions of you before we get to uh, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, uh, same questions, a lot of them, as uh, I asked Rishi Sunak. Uh, tomorrow, FGM confirming that energy price gap, average home for in Oct from, from October. Um, £3,550 a year their annual bill will be. Next summer could be more than £6,000. And it's not just the very poor. You've talked about targeting help for the very poor, minimum wage and people on benefits. They're not the only people who won't be able to afford those bills. There'll be a lot of people here who won't be able to afford those bills. Um, you've probably promised some help. Obviously, there'll be some more help, but I, as I asked Rishi Sunak, do you not have to be a bit more honest with this crowd when you're talking about, oh, you know, you can have tax cuts and growth and it's all going to be fine, that actually you need to be a bit more honest about how much help you're going to have to give people and how much it's going to cost everybody? So my, my approach is, first of all, to cut taxes because we currently have the highest taxes in 70 years in this country. And that is not the way we're going to get economic growth. It's not the way we're going to avoid a recession. And without economic growth, without more jobs, without more wages, we're not going to get the tax revenues in. So that is why it's very, very important that we keep taxes low, that we reverse the national insurance increase. And we also have a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy, which will immediately cut people's fuel bills. But you're right, Julia, we have got a massive issue with people not being able to afford energy. And that's both individuals and businesses. I know a lot of businesses are struggling as well to afford the cost of energy. And what isn't right is to just bung more money into the system. What we actually need to do is fix the supply of energy. And the fact is we haven't been getting enough moving fast enough with nuclear. We haven't been doing enough on renewable energy as well. And we need to do all of those things to fix the energy problem. And rather than simply saying the answer to everything is to give out more cash, we need to look at the root causes of this problem. And that's why I support fracking in areas where there is support for it. It's why I support exploiting those North Sea gas seals, fields as soon as possible, because we need to become more energy independent as a country. And, and if people think that this problem is going to be over in six months, they're not right. This is a long-term problem 
and we will only fix it by taking those difficult decisions. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you talked about fracking, you talked about nuclear, you also mentioned businesses, which was my next question. What are you going to do to help them? They don't have a price cap. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen some businesses, particularly hospitality, facing 300% increases already. Um, realistically, you can't build a nuclear power plant quick enough to deal with the bills that they're going to be facing. We're going to be seeing, seeing businesses closing. We're going to be seeing people losing their jobs. They then can't pay those taxes to help fund the growth and the like that you want to see. So what are you going to do specifically to help businesses when you get into power early September? If well, well, first of all, it's about making sure we're keeping tax on business low. And that is why you know, reversing the national insurance increase is important, so businesses aren't playing employers' national insurance. It's why keeping corporation tax low is important. And it's also looking at how do we encourage companies to use more gas, or how do we encourage energy companies to use more gas in the short term. So it's been quite difficult for the oil and gas sector in terms of exploiting those new reserves in the North Sea. Those are the types of things that we can bring on stream quicker than nuclear. But, but my point about nuclear is the quicker we start, the quicker the problem will be dealt with. It's because of failures 20 years ago that we're in the position we are now. So we need a long-term plan as well as making sure that those short-term supplies are available. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure the tax cuts you promised I mean, so I far is enough. I mentioned the planning system earlier. You know, it is sclerotic. It's taking too long, whether it's getting new energy projects going, whether it's getting transport projects done. And I'm somebody who is prepared to crack through the system and get on with things. But you said local people will have the final say over housing, so they're going to get the final say over fracking or nuclear power stations as well, aren't they? In which case, they'll say, no, thank but you. But what I support is having more incentives in areas, okay. so sharing the benefits. What people don't want is a housing estate plonked in their area with no infrastructure, with no businesses, with no jobs locally. But if you say to people, you have the freedom to decide what is going to happen, people... Certainly a lot of talk uh, TV uh, dis listeners and viewers, the energy, simple, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be secure, and it needs to be affordable. If it's not any of those things, it doesn't work. That's what's happening right now. We don't have a supply that is those things. And it can't be. While the government is committed to net zero, it was a decision that was made after 90 minutes of debate in Parliament. It was uncosted. Later, Philip Hammond said it would cost a trillion pounds. Do you agree that net zero is an unremitting disaster for this country? And will you abandon the policy? So I support net zero by 2050, but we need to be a lot more flexible and a lot more pro-business and pro-consumer in the way we get there. That's why I'm talking about a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy, while we look at better ways of delivering net zero. At the moment, it's very siloed within government. It's not being delivered in the most efficient way. And I also support the use of gas as a transition fuel. I think gas is going to be incredibly important, using our North Sea reserves, doing things like fracking, over the next few years. So we need to be much more flexible about the way we achieve net zero. And we need to care about our energy independence. You know, Putin is perpetrating this appalling war in Ukraine. And we have found out that we were depending on spot markets for our energy supply from around the world, often relying on regimes that aren't entirely reliable. So building our own energy independence is incredibly important. And if I'm selected as Prime Minister, I will get on with doing that straight away. And of course, we need to achieve net zero, but we need to do it in a free enterprise way that is about attracting investment into our country, not in a way that's about clobbering consumers and businesses. OK. <laughs> um. Two events happened on Monday, I think, shocked at the country. A nine-year-old girl uh, she was shot dead in her own home in Liverpool amid drug gang wars, we think. Uh, also, at the same day, 1,300 legal migrants got on boats and arrived in this country and dinghies from France, uh, also just in one day. Um, we appear to have lost control of the streets. We appear to have lost control of the borders. When did the Tory party stop being the party of law and order? Well, there's no doubt that the appalling murder of a girl in Liverpool, you know, I think struck us all as you know, absolutely beyond the pale. And you know, what, what we need to do is make sure that we have more police on our streets. You know, I'm a full supporter of recruiting the 20,000 police officers, but also make sure the police are focusing on the crimes people care about. 
violent crimes, crimes against girls and women like rape and sexual assault, rather than policing Twitter, which I'm afraid there is too much of that going on at the moment. And what, what I would do, what I would do is introduce league tables so it's much clearer how much time police forces are spending on the beat, how successful they are on dealing with crimes that affect people, so that there is much better accountability and scrutiny. And we, we saw that work in education. You know, when I was at school in the 80s, people didn't know how, you know, there were rumours about whether a school was good, but no one saw the figures in front of them. And I think we need to bring it to life for people much more about what the police are actually doing in their it's area. And I think that will nice. put... Well, yes, and I, I fully support stop and search as well. I think we need to use that more and we need to give the police the powers they need. But we also need to make sure that they are subject to public transparency and accountability. You also asked me about immigration. You know, the issue we face, the, the Rwanda policy is a good policy. You know, I went through all these policies. I was on the committee with Priti and others going through what would work. And the Rwanda policy is an effective policy because it means that people have a permanent home that they can be in. All the other solutions, to me, are quite short-term, just pushing the problem around. You know, we need people to have a long-term place they can live in. The problem is the ECHR, which is why I would legislate to make sure the ECHR can't overrule the decisions we make in the United Kingdom. Because that simply isn't democratic. You know, it simply isn't democratic. Let's talk about lockdown. It's been in the news today after an interview that Rishi Sunak did with The Spectator about his role and what he mm -hmm. felt about lockdown at the time. Uh, we are living undoubtedly with the consequences of lockdown, whether it's uh, the economic policy, the, uh, all the crisis we have there, the health service, the education, what's going on in our schools. Um, did you ever, at the time, in 2020 and 2021, question lockdown policy and its likely costs? And if not, why not? Well, the answer is I did. I did question it. I mean, I was not sitting on the committee that made the decisions. There was a specific committee, I think, with the Prime Minister, Chancellor, Health Secretary. I was Trade Secretary at the time, and I was spending my time going hell for leather to get all those trade deals over the line so our businesses would be able to continue exporting and be successful in the future. So that, that's what I was doing. I mean, look, I think when COVID happened, we were all hugely shocked. And there was a you know, discussion about what the response should be. And clearly, in retrospect, we did do too much. You know, it was true draconian. I think there schools? should have been more. I don't think we should have closed schools. Ever. No, I don't think we should. And, you know, I have two daughters who are of school age and are now, you know, mine are teenagers. So it's probably less tough. They're more kind of self reliant and independent. Uh, but I know that people, you know, parents of primary school children, it's very, very difficult. And a lot of children have ended up suffering, you know, educationally with mental health issues as a result of that. And I can assure you and this group here today that I would never impose a lockdown if I am selected as Prime Minister. Okay. Um, touched on the NHS there. The NHS is in crisis. It normally used to be a winter crisis. Now it's a summer crisis as well every year. It's um, always in crisis. Millions of people waiting for some pretty basic treatment. Sometimes years people waiting to get an ambulance just to get into A&E and then waiting outside A&E sometimes for more than 24 hours. Uh, we're supposed to be a first world country and yet we don't have a first world uh, health service. What are you going to do to make it first class? Well, first of all, you know, we need to deal with the backlog that you know, happened as a result of COVID, you know, the very long waits for hospital treatment, GPQs, the difficulty of getting an NHS dentist. You know, here in the east of England, the mental health service and the ambulance service are appalling, and you know, we need to fix those problems. Now, how do we fix those problems? First of all, it's by empowering the front line more. You know, what I've been struck by going around the country is people telling me who work in the NHS, doctors and nurses, just how many layers there are above them, how much central diktat is. So even if they have a better way of doing things, they can't do it because they're prevented from that. And I think we've got to fundamentally change that culture in the NHS. We also had a lot of people during COVID who came in and worked in the NHS as nurses, as doctors. They came out of retirement. They helped out. 
what could we do now to encourage those fantastic people back in to help out with what is another very, very difficult national situation. So I'd want to look at that. And we also need to look at issues like doctors' pensions because some of these perversities in the system mean that we are losing good doctors. But one of the other reasons we're losing doctors and nurses is you know, feeling demotivated because they don't feel empowered. So we have to change the culture of the NHS. In my view, it's not about more money. It's about the culture. And lots of people in the NHS who, who I know and you know, talk to say, you know, there is waste. You know, there's waste of prescription drugs. There's waste of resources. We need to use those resources better. But the people who know are not the people sitting in Whitehall. They're the people sitting in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Kings Lynn. They're the people sitting in the doctor's home. You know, those are the people who know best, and those are the people we have to empower. OK, in a moment, we'll get to audience questions. You get your hands up, and we can get some microphones to the audience. That would be fantastic. Um, my final set of questions are quick fire. Short, sharp answers. Some of them are only one-word answers, please. Uh, put the same questions to Rishi Sunak. After 12 years of the Tories in power, can you name a single uh, public service in this country that works well? Well, I think our education system has got a hell of a lot better over the past 12 years. And One of the last two years. Well, I've talked about yeah. how we shouldn't okay. have closed down schools, but you know, we, we have got better results in English and maths more, you know, our GCSE and exam standards are higher. Okay. And we have delivered better schools. Quick fire. Of what? Quick fire. We've got, the audience want to ask their questions. These <laughs> okay, people have right. come a long way. Um, President Macron, friend or foe? The, the jury's out. But if I, if I, if I, if I, if I become, if I become Prime Minister, I'll judge him on deeds, not words. <laughs> Police officers, dancing the Macarena or investigating crimes? Investigating crimes, obviously. Uh, can someone tell the <laughs> police That's what they that. should be doing. Um, mask yeah. mandates or no mask mandates? No mask mandates. Yes or no? Is a trans woman a woman? No. The BBC, Tory bias, Labour bias or studiously neutral? I don't think anybody is neutral and I think we're all kidding ourselves if we pretend there are institutions or people who are neutral. I'd rather have more honest bias. Who would you rather be stuck in a lift with, Keir Starmer or Nicola Sturgeon? Uh, probably, I think Nicola Sturgeon. Why? Well, I'd hope to persuade her to stop being a separatist by the time we got to the ground floor. <laughs> and I just, frankly, uh, frankly, the idea of being stuck in a lift with Keir Starmer strikes me as extremely boring. <laughs> Do you know what Rishi Sunak said? He said he'd take the stairs. <laughs> uh, finally, if not you, who would make a better Prime Minister, Boris Johnson or Rishi Sunak? Boris Johnson. <laughs> well, interesting. Same question, some very different answers there. Uh, thank you very much, Julie. That's the end of my questions. And now we've got time for questions from the audience. Uh, has anyone here got a microphone? Right, there's a chap over there. Yeah, there's the lady just there, just in front of you. Lovely. If you could say who you are, we can keep the questions as brief as possible. We can get as many as possible in. I'll try. Hello, uh, Ruth Betson. I'm the Eastern Region Chairman for CWO and the Regional Ambassador for CPF. That's all the time we have. Yeah, no. <laughs> so for the next general election, we need great policies, but we also need activists to get out and knock on the doors and campaign. If you become the leader of the Conservative Party, how are you going to help us get more activists, more boots on the ground? Okay. Well, I've been a Conservative Party member since 1996, and I've knocked on a lot of doors. I've been a councillor, I've been a constituency chairman. And I think what we need to do is we need to provide more support, so more professional agents, less money spent in central office, more money spent on the field, so that when they feel they're making progress, when it's fun, that's when they come out and campaign, and that's the culture we have to create. It's obviously, it's obviously very alive and well in South West Norfolk, I point out to all the activists I see in the audience. Uh, let's put over here at the back. Hi, my name is Dan. Um, I'm told tirelessly that you cannot be gay and support the Tories. So what would you say to those people and what are your main priorities for the LGBT plus community? Well, that, that, that is just absolutely rubbish, frankly. And, you know, 
what we stand for as conservatives, and we don't stand for identity politics. We care about your talent, your hard work, you know, what you stand for, your character, not whether you're gay or straight or whether you're a man or a woman or which ethnic minority background you're from. And that's why people want to join the Conservatives, because they don't want to be treated as one of a type or one of a group. They want to be treated for the people that they are. I'm trying to avoid questions from people who bought a T-shirt supporting their candidate, but I allowed one for Rishi, so one for you, Liz, as well, this young man at the front here. Evening, Liz. Uh, I'm Tommy, 15-year-old school student, Norwich. Uh, just quite a simple question. How do we balance the right of trans people to be who they are with common sense, the right of people to have single-sex spaces, and the rights of women to be women? Well, this is, thank, thanks for your question, Tommy. This is exactly what I did as Minister for Women and Equalities. I improved the process for gender recognition to make it simpler and kinder, but I was very clear that those under 18 shouldn't be able to make irreversible decisions about their own future, and that we should treat everybody with respect. We should treat everybody with respect, and we should treat people on the basis of what they have to offer, not on um, you know, whether or not they are a you know, transgender or, or, you know, not, not transgender. Are you going to protect um, single sex spaces? You've talked about um, refuges and things mm. like that, but what about you know, the changing rooms at Marks and Spencers, which are currently, even if you're, you're taking your child for their first you know, bra fitting, are uh, open to men to use as well? I am very clear, and I've made this clear in Parliament, that places absolutely have the ability to restrict access on the basis of biological sex. That is a very important right. And you know, that should be totally true in the public sector, in schools, in domestic violence shelters. Now, I'm also somebody who believes in freedom. And Marks and Spencers is a shop. You know, they can decide their policies as they see fit. And I can decide to go in Marks and Spencers or not according to whether I want to. So I think it's different. Would you take your daughters to, have a, to use a changing room in a shop which, where a man could walk in? Well, I, I, <laughs> we're going to do I have been to the bra fitting service in Marks and Spencers, and, and it is always behind a curtain, Julia. And no one, no one has ever tried to open the curtain while I'm in there. <laughs> um, lady just here. I'm Diane from Cambridgeshire. Um, Liz, I understand that there's a long overdue um, strategy for social care that's due to be published this year. Um, will you commit to that being published? And given that you're reversing the national insurance increase, how would you actually plan to fund um, anything to help social care for the future? So on the national insurance increase, I still would spend the 13 billion but I would take it out of general taxation. And what we saw is the OBR forecast dramatically fluctuated. In fact, we are still able to do that and start paying down the debt within three years, so I'd still spend the money. But what I would do is push more of it towards social care, because at the moment, the vast majority has been taken up by the National Health Service. And in fact, that's counterproductive, because what we have is people in beds in the National Health Service who would really be better served by being in social care. So I will make sure more of that money goes to councils to help with social care, whilst, of course, we deal with the long-term strategy. But it's very important we get that money to councils now because I know how much they are struggling with the ability to fund social care. Uh, Gentlemen, somewhere over here with a microphone. Lovely. Could you stand up? Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Uh, Bob Holstrom. Uh, just by way of background, uh, my colleague and I, colleagues and I run 1.2 billion in the markets. My son-in-law is a gas trader, hated person at the moment, obviously. But what worries us is the fact that you were going to have a budget and then you decided not to have a budget. Um, for those that are not in the know, if you have a budget, you have to forecast and publish uh, a, a budgetary forecast showing what the impact might be on the economy you refuse not to do it. Why not? Well, the, there have been a number of fiscal events this year, none of which have 
had that forecast, I would point out. Look, what, what's important, and you can call it a budget, you can call it a fiscal event, what's important is we take urgent action to sort out the issues we have in this country. And issue number one is we are currently projected to have a recession. And I believe we need to keep our taxes low, we need to reverse the national insurance increase to make sure that we are driving investment into our economy and we're driving growth into the economy. We also need to take bold action to deal with energy supply, and I'm committed to doing that. And you know, these kind of processology questions of exactly what the event is called, that is not relevant. What is relevant is I'm somebody who is prepared to take action, to do what it takes to fix the issues our country has, to sort out the energy crisis, but also to get our economy growing, which is so vital at this time. There's a lady over here. Rachel from Norfolk, and I own an SME in your constituency, and we have a labour shortage in this country. But at the same time, we have, I don't know the numbers, millions of asylum seekers who are not allowed to work, and I'm confused as to why they're not allowed to work and earn money and put money back into society. Was that, sure. What's your question? Why can't, they, why can't they work? Why are asylum seekers not allowed to work when we have a labour shortage? It's years and years that they're, they're waiting. Okay. And so we, we also have huge numbers of people in this country, millions of people who are economically inactive. And I think it's very important that we are encouraging more people who are currently uh, on the welfare system into work and getting into those jobs. And that's a particular issue in the aftermath of COVID. I mean, the reason why we don't enable asylum seekers to work is it creates even more of a magnet to come to the United Kingdom. And I'm determined to make sure we deal with illegal immigration. And I'm determined to make sure that we don't for, for you know, I absolutely support immigration where we need it. And I've talked about expanding the seasonal agricultural workers scheme to help our farmers. But where there are people in Britain who are currently economically inactive, who could be trained up to do those jobs, that should be our first port of call, getting those people into work. Um, lady here at the front. I'm Geeta Patel from Cambridgeshire. Um, to prevent tax, um, to prevent, sorry, I'm going to start again. To prevent tax cuts, um, raising inflation, you're going to have to cut spending. Where will you cut spending? Well, I don't, I don't agree with this analysis that tax cuts deliver inflation. I think it's wrong. The reason that we have inflation is we have a supply shock caused by COVID, caused by the global energy crisis. And what I am proposing to do, in some cases, is not raising taxes, it's just keeping taxes low. So I can't for the life of me see why raising corporation tax is going to create inflation. I mean, or going to stop inflation. What it's going to do is stop economic growth and put this country into a recession. And what we need to do is we need to be growing our economy and growing the supply of goods and services, which will help deal with the issue of inflation. So I just don't think that analysis is right at all. All right, um, gentleman over here with the microphone. Hello, Foreign Secretary. Uh, James Noble um, from Saffron Wilden now, formerly Brighton Kemp Town. Um, free trade was meant to be one of the great benefits of Brexit. Um, and of course, it's got additional benefits of reducing prices in the shop at a time where many people are struggling to buy food from the supermarkets. Are you a free trader or are you a protectionist? And can we have some radical thinking on this, please? Hey. I, I am a free trader and I have scars on my back from the battles in Whitehall to get, to get the Australia trade deal through, the New Zealand trade deal. We're currently negotiating a deal with India. I think that's a massive opportunity. It's likely to be done by the end of this year. We're negotiating access to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is worth billions of pounds to the UK economy. And I'm determined to make sure we do that and we open up those opportunities for the United Kingdom. And we've got so many great goods that we can export from this country, but of course we need to, we need to deliver it. Uh, gentlemen over here. 
my name is Dennis. Um, I understand we currently import 6% of our electricity from France through the undersea interconnectors. Energy independence is clearly very current at the moment with Russia in the headlines. Would you sign the contract in favour of EDF and hand it to Mr Macron for our nuclear industry? <laughs> Wales. Well, I, I'm very clear that we need to boost our nuclear industry, including Sizewell, including the small modular reactors that are produced in Derbyshire. And frankly, I would rather that we do have more homegrown nuclear expertise, and regrettably we lost that because we failed to do these things 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But it is, if it's a choice between relying on France and relying on China, I would take France. <laughs> Gentleman in the T-shirt over there. If you could stand up, please. Uh, I'm in a wheelchair. Oh, I do apologise. It's all right, don't worry. <laughs> um, Miss Truss, if you're lucky enough to become Prime Minister, what will you do to tackle the current crisis in legal aid? Uh, you've spoken a great deal about the need for more police officers on the streets, but to my mind, this makes little sense if there's not the criminal barristers in court to defend and prosecute the criminals. Now, you stood there and said you say no to, you don't say no to anybody, but you have said no to Andrew Neil. Why don't you go on the Andrew Neil show? How are we supposed to take you seriously if you cannot stand up to his scepticism okay. and criticism? Well, I don't know about you, but I think Julia Hartley Brewer is much <laughs> tougher than Andrew Neil. She often doesn't come on my show either. <laughs> I have occasionally been on your show. It is fair to ask, though. We do need to have politicians who are willing to take scrutiny and not expect soft questions. I have done they? many, many broadcast interviews during this campaign with all sorts of people, including Nick Robinson, including Julia Hartley Brewer, including Tom Newton Dunn. I mean, that's pretty difficult. <laughs> <laughs> um, gentlemen over here. Hello, Liz. Are we working? Yep. Hi, I'm Rory. Um, I run a business in Deerham. Um, the market, market towns and cities are the hubs of our community, um, but yet the high street has been in decline for years. Uh, business rate reform is long overdue. Um, we're face, you know, the high street's going to face some challenging times. Um, how are you going to save the high street and support uh, local or independent retailers? Well, you are right that business rate reform is very long overdue. What I would plan to do is have a review of the tax system it's far too complicated. We've got one of the most complicated tax systems in the world. And part of that will be looking at the entire business rates system and also all the other taxes we place on small businesses. We also need to look at the regulations because, frankly, it has become more complicated to run a business. And that is a problem because small businesses are the lifeblood of our economy. Okay. Just one final question. Gentlemen here, as brief as you can, please. Uh, I don't like, no, read the question. That means it's All a bit right. long. Come on, short no, no, and sharp. I've, I've got it to keep it brief. <laughs> okay. Hello, Liz. Hi. Um, my name is Sheridan. Tens of thousands of qualified, experienced scientists have strongly rejected the theory of catastrophic man made climate change and net zero cuckoo land. They simply point out that the raw scientific data has never supported Come those on. claims. Question. This is my question. If you are successfully appointed to be our new British Prime Minister, will your government finally set up a full scientific investigation into whether this wild theory is based on real science or whether it is unscientific political propaganda? Okay. Well, I mean, I already said earlier that I do support the net zero target, but we need to get to it in a way that works for businesses and consumers and also protects our energy independence. I think we've seen what it is like to end up depending on authoritarian regimes, and we need to avoid that at all costs. Okay, let's say a big thank you now to Liz Trust for taking all those questions. Thank you very much thank you. indeed. Thank You're you. much tougher than Andrew Hill. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. We, we have just one more hustings to go, and that is uh, next Wednesday. That can... The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that 
African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, what are you were singing? The masters of the field were coming. We who are boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. And that's for, God. And and that's for God. Opoku, right? Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming. Mm -hmm. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing, Prepare the world, yeah, 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 yeah. Prepare the world, yeah. Then we go more, then we'll keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then we will sing, ah, uh, when they tire, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens, Diplo, Owens, are we the We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field and best athletes. Famous to all and decent boys, how would you prove? Then they will start. I've been quiet. I have a eye. 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 I One dollar, one CD. In the time of Mills and Mahama, two CDs, one dollar. If I was then, I would say to the people of Ghana, I'm sorry. We are sorry for the poor work we have done. We're going to go and think about ourselves. But that is not the people we're dealing with. The fruits of office, the money, the money under the table has become sweet for them. So they're determined to stay. Are we going to allow that to happen? Are we going to allow that to happen? In Kufo's time, one of the people who advised and helped him develop a strong CD was my running mate, Muhammadu Baumia. Then he was deputy governor 
of the Bank of Ghana. It's one of the reasons I brought him to come and join me, that we will welcome the CD and create again a strong CD that will be able to allow us to develop our economy and allow our traders and our to be able to develop. We have told the world, we have told the world that under our leadership, we're going to turn our back on the old economy, the raw material exporting economy, and build a new industrial value-adding economy in our country that will bring jobs for our people and for especially for the young people of our country. That is the goal of the new NPP government and the administration of the national government. A competitive labor force because we're going to give all the children of our country an opportunity. Hello, we're going to give all the children of our country an opportunity. Hello, we're going to give all the children of our country an opportunity. Hello, we're going to give all the children of our country an opportunity. Hello, we're going to give all the children of our country an opportunity. Hello, we're going to give all the children of our country an opportunity. I was here for 2020. IMF, my Ghana, one billion dollars, billion with a B. Same year, no World Bank, my Ghana, 430 million dollars. Nina for COVID. Every year, you know, in 2021, no IMF for some my Ghana, one billion dollars bill. One billion with a B. Now, World Bank Sama Ghana, 130 million dollars. In 2021, no, so one billion, 130 million, yeah, if he World Bank buy any IMF buy, no. Now, we say post COVID rejuvenation program, say, what be my young economy, no, so into no, World Bank, the IMF, this is Ghana, Ghana, Ghana government core. Bank of Ghana could eat 20 billion cities to say COVID in tea. Now, which are for what World Bank come on with two billion? Uh, I am a farmer with two billion. World Bank am a more 560 million dollars for COVID. I know on some most sound call Bank of Ghana could eat 20 billion cities say COVID in tea. Says he can move who can time trying here. And I went to the city. The city is the city of Ghana. The levy tax, the ports, the levy, the airport, the hotels. But they are to be the city of Ghana. The levy, the levy, the levy. The city is the city of petrol. The levy. The city is the port. The levy. The city is the city of Ghana. And they say, the government is the city of the city of Ghana. The city is the city of Ghana. The city is the city of Ghana. E levy nere ba yes ye pesi ye chile government se enye se ya juni nye ju mo ye hu nye kosono ni ye jai amano if you say wo pesi ye wu nye e levy yen ye ye responsible citizens yen pesi ye 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 stand by ye jina ho ke ka ye train fire hu or no anoke se ye se ye responsible citizens right inti ye ye responsible citizens nane tine se se wo pesi ye wo fuhi si ka now, would the Ebribia because young credit rating record former and yet young Abra bought now the E levy barber to so I didn't because there is over three almost three billion Ghana cities a record to the presidency three billion Ghana in detail so by 75 percent what also by 75 percent I would say by 375 million dollars 375 million save and not at the presidency. You don't need three billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you, Mr. Kufuado? And the near cost of presidency. Then now what is the kind of presidency? What? What are you? Then what is she usruku? And now then now what are you? Legislature, let Ghana legislators. You have about 275 legislators. Then now some legislators know what you mean Ghana. Say say minimum can say he Ghana free. You bet me after I install Watson, 
IBM computer of Renisi Watson, no, ah, a year artificial intelligence, ah, ebe ye nine, over ninety percent of young parliamentarians, no, ye bet me replace one with Watson, Watson computer, ben wedjuma, na, yen downscale, ah, then ye here two hundred and seventy five parliamentarians, ah, then wo ye magana, one liability to Ghanaians, no, ye over hundred thousand cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. Kona kubun kunta ala na he. Enu echi. Wa wa judiciary. Judiciary he. America ye 330 million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana ye 30.8 million. America wa 9 Supreme Court judges. Ekufu wado ba na nsinye yi. Ghana niye wa 10 Supreme Court judges. Ekufu wado. A pointi 8. Akaho, in to say, say Ghana, 30, a, a country of less than 31 million people, no, ye wo 18 Supreme Court judges. Ding ne how yang 18. Ding na, I think yang na, just a cronger will be as in Ghana, ne won't ye hear Supreme Court judges. Ding tin ye wo Supreme Court judges. A country of less than 31 million, 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka, ka, one Supreme Court judge, Biano. Liability, April hundred and fifty thousand dollars, hundred and fifty thousand cities a month. Kona kubun kunta he ne V eight order them ne bodyguards ne ne driver ne ne te, ne krone ba then in ti ni yafa an extra eight Supreme Court judges. Enu kwancheng se si ame ne mokase ya wo thirty four eh eh wo friending ambassadorial post around the world thirty four. Vatican City, ah, a will room cry ye wo ambassador wo ho. Deng na ambassador wo Vatican City ye magana. Munkan chile ye nge. A deng ni ye wo ambassadors wo baby to say Malta nom ne eh, wo friend deng Sri Lanka si eh, su Sudan nom ni ade. Deng, o komuna ye ni ade ba inti ni ye wo ambassadors wo Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. Se wo re e levy. What is this? Ye san wo uh, 58 uh, uh, diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission, no, and Kahun Fasuna said, What will trade desk? Eddie income, commerce, a bread Ghana. So, diplomatic missions around the world, they are 58. Sika Beng, what the bread Ghana. Moon country near here. A year crong waste of money and resource. Musi Mu Hue E Levy. Your bachelor must say E Levy, no, Moon Konamuko Yi Infimuamut for tomb. Positions now, more creative, who name Fasono, and one Namunko Yi Infi. I think that more how Ghana for sa MPP for then na Ghana for why you na not the BI in TSA in TSA no sa position see now it was hey over 2,000 executive positions are what were executive benefits ne perks what to kwang wo business class one ya four by four no money at this honey money nurse who you feel and I what also and no no be ma e levy no income from e levy ni you've been here for a mrosom 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 then necessary catch there a good word in the government says sad no moon koi in fi honum na mo boka gana foka unnecessarily na mo be we yi na we na excavator sa unyanku pando mi yen say yen san koka ni yen nang na ni yen fan ye si ka ni yen fan tu ye yi levi kason mo be kache yin se mo akwa shi wo excavator is 85 excavator sa ba akon ye over 150,000 to 200,000 mo sa akwa shi wo na kahon na Pan on where he yeezy. Cop no where he, a tin where he anum, cop no so a wild bonaca home. Eh, a cufado and his government. Why? Gana fo. Yam penende and penetina, ye levy no one eye as a bash and one anna while crafty scan was a ba. Yam pen in a lay walk when eh, eh, yanamo barber could ye be genome the name and say yer and penet, a cufado and his government. A ding, a ding. What say when? Uh, cluelessness meets unpreparedness, no? MPP, Mfoni, now be hum ho. Yabram, we're not going to take this, we're not having this. Mumfa, ye mpene ne mpene china, ye levinu, ye jia. Mumko, inko kat, legislature. Mumko kat, executive. Mumko kat, judiciary. Nasi kan ambassadors, any, wa friend, ambassadorial post, 
and a ye diplomatic missions. Sanya many now won't cancel, no more reduce, no more for computers in your hair. Legislators say, Yeah, what 275? No, you bet me the drone, drone, I replace you one. You hear 275 at the maximum four per region. You hear 64 parliamentarians. You hear 211 parliamentarians. No, where liability to Ghana at about 100,000 cities every month. You in Chawung in Fiho. Come on, enough of this nonsense. You hear him. You hear him. I want you to in class symbol. Okay. Okay. So when we are in class symbol of knowledge, strength, adaptability, <laughs> energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love, strength. Said in class symbols when you are a boy, 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 Na ye di aka and in class symbols in a home. Okay. Now Ghana for what tena si ya hunu se se di an anadu nan kwa kufu adu ebu ne mayno. Ye ni jehon. Enti this is the ed in class symbol for failure. What? It's a free nade ko. Se ed in class symbol. Yo kuku mu spes imi yu nu ya. A ka ed in class symbol so. The president is now a bitch. A free nade ko. Uku mu spes imi yu nu ya. A ka ed in class symbol so. Photo. It's an ed in class symbol for failure. You are I beg and are you are a man. 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 You a a man. You a man. You are a man. You are a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a